Karen is director and librarian of the John Carter Brown Library, as well as a professor of history at Brown University. Her complete bio is available to you on the NISO event page for today's event. But one of the things that I think is particularly critical is that Karen, as a researcher herself, understands what it is that the user needs and wants to be able to do. And part of her work in the role of the of being the Beatrice and Julio Mauro Santo Domingo director and librarian there at John Carter Brown is that she works to enhance and grow the library's collection for the early Americas and as the International Center for Advanced Research in History and the Humanities. So I think she brings a very important and unique perspective to our event today. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing my slides, Karen, and I'm going to turn over the podium to you. Thank you so much, Jill. Will you just give me a thumbs up and let me know that you can hear me and see my slides? You're good to go. We can see you Excellent. and we can hear you. Thank you so much. It's such a pleasure to be here with such a terrific group of panelists at such an interesting event to talk about um, the essential, deeply contextual um, and very resource intensive work um, of digitization. I'm also going to um, emphasize naturally uh, the kind of ongoing project here at the John Carter Brown Library of what we think of as whole library digitization and discovery and how those things come together. I'm so glad that Jill mentioned um, Roger and Deanna's book Along Came Google, which is a book that um, I was delighted to read and to think along side. Um, and also just to think about how a library like the JCB and indeed how special collections intersect with the processes um, they were describing. I'll be really interested to see if other folks have, have thoughts about that. So with that, let me just launch here. I have about 20 some minutes worth of comments and then I think we have a few minutes uh, that Jill has left for any questions. And I'd love to, for that space to be a little bit um, of not just questions, but also conversation. So let's see if I can, there we go. Um, so I'm going to offer uh, a look at this very, very specific, very special library as a case study in processes, challenges, and critical opportunities um, for the digitization of collection, but also thinking about what a collection really is and why it matters to think about a total uh, library. I'm going to start getting into this context, uh, not just because I'm a historian, and so I always think that the context matters, though that is very true as well, but because I think it's really important for any digitization effort to have a kind of raison d'etre, or if not a reason for being, then certainly a reason for digitizing. And in the case of the John Carter Brown Library, that reason for digitizing is deeply to do with the traditions of the library and how we have come to understand those traditions uh, in a variety of different critical contexts. Um, so uh, the JCB uh, was created as the private library of John Carter Brown, who was the, and I, for, I confess, I forget which generation of Browns he was. This is of course the, the Brown family that founded the university with a gift in the early 19th century. Jordan Carter Brown was uh, the nth generation of that family. Um, and uh, he was like others in his family before him, although he became much more assertively a, a bibliophile. He began collecting in the mid 19th century, a kind of great era for, um, for, uh, for collecting and um, an, an era of intensive interest of Americans in uh, Europe in collecting from Europe um, and the beginnings of a real interest in collecting what they began uh, to call um, Americana. So let me unpack that just a little bit. Um, John Carter Brown uh, had some, already had a kind of book collection, but by the 1840s, he's in his 40s then too, 
um, he was uh, liaising with a bookseller uh, in London. And in 1846, his first invoiced material arrived from London. In fact, we have those invoices. The very first one is 13 pages long. It lists hundreds of items uh, focused on the early Americas. These are almost entirely European books, many of them in Spanish, Portuguese, French, Dutch, and English, but the majority in Spanish. The first of those, the earliest of them, tend to emphasize uh, Spanish exploration, um, of the Americas, and some of them actually include some of the earliest critiques of um, Atlantic slavery, um, the great de las Casas um, critique of uh, Spanish uh, in uh, involvement in, uh, in the commodification of African people in the slave trade. So John Carter Brown's son um, left a legacy to establish the library um, in a new building. Uh, he had been collecting this library in his home. It's still a very beautiful home and it's now a center here at Brown. Um, and he, John Carter Brown had built the library kind of fireproof, um, but it was, uh, it was outgrowing its space and maybe the family would like, the, uh, like that space for other things. I'm not entirely sure. Um, but John Nicholas Brown left a legacy to establish the library in his father's name in a new building, which opened in 1904 and was expanded in 1990. As I said, the library specializes in what was then called and which we continue to call in kind of um, startle quotes, so which we contextualize Americana. Books, maps, and manuscripts, primarily books though, about the early Americas, North and South America uh, before 1800. And we hold about 65,000 items um, in the library. So, as a quick primer, I'm going to talk about uh, kind of the process of digitization at the library, but as a quick primer, we have about 30,000 digital items. Uh, the JCB has a longstanding digital uh, commitment. We have two different places where uh, digital objects are located right now, and I'll talk a little bit about how we're about to synthesize those in a project that will open in the fall. Um, one uh, on a database, I'll give you the link at the end too where there are about 15,000 images and maps. And then in a partnership with Internet Archive, we have possibly, uh, it's more than 15,000 now, this number was in, in January of 21, uh, it might be up to 15 and a half thousand uh, books on Internet Archive. So we think about a little more than a third of the collection is digitized, it's ongoing. Literally, I have a colleague who is on the floor below me who is digitizing as we speak. And crucially, just to reiterate, um, the JCB is committed to digitizing its entire collection. This is uh, the building that we're housed in here um, on the campus at Brown. The trees don't look quite that beautiful yet. They will in just a couple of weeks. The building itself is quite beautiful, classic Beaux-Arts building. Again, I said from, as I said, from 1904, uh, the architects were some kind of classic Boston architects. I show this to you, not just because the building itself is beautiful, but because the building itself embodies a sense of what the library meant to be in 1904 when it opened. That is, it is meant to be a kind of classical temple of learning. It is meant to be um, a kind of exclusive space for advanced research and learning. And coming to grips, not just with the kind of colonialist uh, background of collecting rooted in the 19th century and in presumptions about European knowledge, which I'll say more about in a moment, um, but also about how that stuff is in this container, this very specific building, which is beautiful and which I want more people in. And we have a welcome and access plan that's going to be quite exciting, I think. But also as we think about coming to terms with the materials in a context, the library itself, the building itself is a critical context. So just to go back for a moment to that point about Americana as a context and the early Americas, um, some of my colleagues uh, at NISO have heard me talk about the early Americas um, at some length in other contexts. I continue to say that the early Americas is an absolutely critical historical context for us. Many of us are aware of how often early America is invoked as this kind of critical historical foundation for the United States. Well, early America is a critical historical foundation in many different dimensions, and certainly the origins of the United States, yes, the origins of other democratic nations, um, Haiti um, and Latin American nations in the same kind of period of revolutions, but it is also 
a period that is foundationally indigenous history, most profoundly indigenous history, if only by simple demographics, and also utterly entwined um, with uh, the enslavement of African peoples. So when we think about the early Americas, we are thinking about both um, the kind of the complex violence of the early Americas, and we're also thinking about the extraordinary promise of the period, the promise of democracy, the hope of science, even as we think about uh, these other contexts. So this very specific history in these very specific collections in this very specific building, this is in large part why we think whole library digitization is so important. It is in fact our reason for digitization. So a quick, um, a quick, sorry, I'm just gonna check my time here. Um, uh, a quick history of technology at the JCB, which is also important to understand. Um, you know, a library's mission is, it's easy to say it's about preservation and access, which of course it always is. And those are activities which are deeply complex, resource intensive, require for the most part, um, expert staffing, uh, but those are also in service of, that is preservation and access is in service of creating and disseminating new knowledge. The JCB, like other places, has long interpreted that as meaning serving advanced researchers, so serving graduate students or visiting researchers. We have a very robust fellowship program and we welcome advanced humanities researchers from around the world, but we also know that, um, that there are other wider uses for these materials. Um, and one example would be that in our extensive collections, we have um, so many different languages represented, European languages, as I mentioned, it's just even in that first invoice from 1846, Spanish, Portuguese, French, Dutch, English, but um, in our ongoing collecting since then, um, we also have hundreds of indigenous languages represented in the materials. And in fact, as I'll mention later, um, that's some of the heaviest use of our digital materials. So in each one of these, to go back to technology and how it's connected to um, preservation and access, every one of these moments of, um, of technology um, requires kind of thinking about uh, preservation, thinking about um, expert staffing. It's about a resource, but it's also about standards. Um, it's also about um, interconnectedness with other, um, other libraries. So the JCB's photostat um, was um, a, an exciting development back in the first decade of the library's um, uh, existence in a separate building in 1913. Um, you'll notice on my slides, it says there are a lot of things about the JCB is the first two. I actually, um, I'm not sure about some of those things, but, um, but it is the lore that's handed down. And in some ways, the lore that's handed down about our institutions is important to contend with too. So uh, the photostat machine uh, was significant because the purpose of it, of course, was to share the materials more widely, as well as to find new ways of preserving some of our most, um, at, the, at that moment, um, precious uh, items. Why have these copies? You have them in order to preserve them and to share them. The card catalog, of course, I think we all understand the significance of the card catalog, but I think it's also always worth noting that the catalog enables discovery of us who work in libraries still have the experience that there are things you can do, and in fact, often in our libraries that you must do in the card catalog that you can't do in the online catalog. So the online material is really an extension. And microfilm, again, preservation and access. Now, I wanna pause here by noting that each one of these items, the photostat, the card catalog, microfilming, and more are interpretive acts, that is, there are scholars um, in and out of archives and libraries who have been saying for more than a decade now that we need to think about how individual archival items are themselves embodying um, echoes of the past, biases of the past, that their selection and collection, that their very existence embodies uh, the biases of the past. The fact that collections tend to be overwhelmingly kept by and about European white free men 
tells us a lot about who is not represented in our collections. In other words, we are getting a pretty good vantage on how it is that the things that we hold are a limited reflection of the full past. But it's also true as many scholars, again, working in and, and outside of archives and libraries have been telling us that the way we understand those collections and the way we describe them is also an interpretive act. So what to do, what to run through the photostat, how to develop cataloging, whether it's in a card catalog or, or online, and how to decide what gets microfilmed and shared. All of these are interpretive acts so that the kinds of scholarship that a library like the John Carter Brown is supporting the kind of interpretive research that is going out into the world by, for example, the fellows that come here to work on our materials is one of the interpretive acts that comes out of the library. The very intellectual infrastructure of the library itself is another in set of interpretive acts that libraries embody. So um, when we get to digitization, of course, the situation is the same. We have intense um, interpretive um, acts going on here. Um, I think, you know, all of us are uh, familiar with Safia Noble's work or other folks who have talked about how search and algorithm um, are, are shaped by, uh, by bias and by, even if not overt bias, even if not by overt racism and, and misogyny, um, nonetheless, can, uh, can hold priorities of one moment in time. That is things that we think are important now. There is no telling that we will think those same things are important in 10 years. In fact, it's highly likely that we will think something else is quite important. So when we think about digitizing and we think about our digitization program, we think about how is it that that digitization program is reflecting the current priorities that we have and how can we be transparent about that? So the, the JCB's first um, uh, launch into digital collections was in 2005 with a digital collection called the Archive of Early American Images, which is still online um, using the Luna uh, platform. Uh, you can see the URL there. And we have an incredible number of truly gorgeous and free to use images on Luna. You can also connect to it through the JCB's website, jcblibrary.org. Um, let me pause for a moment and just mention that as we think about all the resource intensive work that we do in digitizing, thinking about our policies for use is a key factor. Um, I, I have been asked even as recently as this week, why on earth any um, institution would make their materials free, uh, freely available. I think many of us can make an argument about why that's important to do, that there are many ethical issues around, um, around openness and accessibility, some of those having to do with whether we can sustain um, our programs and whether we can sustain the staffing that's, uh, that's required. I was really interested to read Andrea Wallace's new report um, just this week um, describing the glam sector. I know all of us are as excited as I am to be part of the glam sector. Anyway, um, galleries, libraries, archives, and museums. Um, but uh, thinking about uh, what the open uh, policies are in different um, institutions and how often those are not synchronous. Well, for the JCB, we've gone through an evolution of thinking about uh, what our open policies are, but our, our uh, materials are completely free to use. We ask only for a credit. Um, and uh, that is true both of the materials on Luna um, and also on Internet Archive. In 2010, uh, we arranged, uh, we created an arrangement with Internet Archive, which was truly exciting because for a small library like the JCB, um, it was a way for us to get um, Internet, uh, to get, um, to partner with an emerging resource. Internet Archive in 2010 was not the Internet Archive of 2022, um, but to partner with an emerging resource um, and to get some expert guidance on doing in-house um, scanning, which we weren't doing up to that point. So that's that was uh, particularly exciting. I think uh, the ongoing question about our digitization program, like anybody's digitization program, 
is um, how do not just uh, how do you staff this, but how do you keep the material, the digital objects themselves, up to date, the metadata um, evolving? How do you um, keep revisiting the same material without doing the same work over and over again? I'm sharing here um, some use statistics from January of 2021. So these are these are not um, these are these are not right this right this minute. Um, but what it suggests is that we have a very wide distribution um, of users um, around the world. And one of the things I want to note here is that for us, um, our uses, um, yes, they come a lot from the United States. Yes, you can see um, uh, California and Virginia heavily located there. We think sometimes that has to do with um, classroom use. But our most used resources are indigenous language resources, often, uh, not often, there are a couple of key examples where the JCB has the single item remaining of a language where there is a language reclamation project. So it's crucial that we have that material not only digitized, but digitized to an incredibly high standard um, for sharing and for access. Let me go back to the original um, title of this talk, which was um, whole of library digitization. What do I mean by whole of library? Well, one obvious thing is this point about um, uh, we're digitizing our entire collection. We're committed to getting to 65,000 um, items and going. Um, that's a major commitment um, of all kinds. Um, but it's also a point that uh, digitization actually requires almost every member of staff in our library to touch that process, whether it is in administration or in curatorial cataloging, um, reading room staff, um, stacks management, all of it. Literally, there isn't a staff member who isn't engaged in our ongoing digitization project. So sometimes, uh, you know, People ask me about digitization and they think we just need a better camera or another person to do the scanning. And that's, uh, that's certainly true that that is helpful, but it really is a, a point that digitization pervades the workflow um, of a library. Certainly it does our library, which means that when we think about the resources necessary for a whole library digitization, um, we think about um, resourcing the entire staff. More than that, though, and this is the point on which I want to end, um, when we think about whole library digitization, we're not just thinking about our digitizing our entire collection, and we're not just thinking about um, how all of our staff is deeply engaged with digitization. We're thinking about how our library is itself digital. That is, we do not just hold digital surrogates. We have digital objects, and we have physical objects, and they interrelate, importantly. We have a physical uh, building and we have digital real estate and they are part and parcel of our library. The John Carter Brown Library is a physical space. It is a digital space. It has physical objects and it has digital objects. And as we think about our mutual responsibility to that whole library, we think about our mutual responsibility to our users who are here in the library, but you know, increasingly from the moment of our first digital initiatives, increasingly not in our physical space, but out there in the world. They're out there in the world and we have uh, an obligation to bring them high standard materials. Yes, the example of indigenous language materials suggests some of the deeper ethical and political commitments behind this, but there is something more even beyond that, which is um, something I mentioned right at the beginning, which is thinking about how every item in our collection is part of this library. It has been brought into a very specific institution. It has been brought into a set of collecting priorities that have evolved, but originate in the 19th century. That 1846 first invoice um, arrived here in Providence, Rhode Island with a, a box, a crate, uh, many crates actually, uh, large crates um, of books during the same month that the United States was going to war with Mexico. In those same months that the United States was going to Mexico, John Carter Brown was thinking about the Americas. He was thinking hemispherically about North and South America. He was thinking in ways informed by his own 
perspective, his own background, his family background as a New Englander, a man of great means and a person with a particular perspective. And over time collecting of course has reflected the perspectives and the priorities of library staff, directors, boards, and so on. This is a very specific place. This is a specific container. So when someone accesses one of our digital objects, I want them to understand that it comes not from some disaggregated, disembodied context, that it comes from this very specific place, that it has a context on its own, yes, but it also has this context as part of a wider set of uh, imperatives and, and history. Thank you. I'm gonna stop now and see if there are some questions and comments. And while our attendees are thinking and running to their type keyboards to input a question, let me ask you something, Karen, that I think is critical in any discussion of the work that both libraries and content providers do when talking about digitization. Based on your conversations with fellow historians, what do you think are some of the frustrations that researchers have in trying to discover and actually use some of the digital collections that are being created? Well, um, so Jill, I think there are two ways to answer that question and I'm gonna go at it, you won't be surprised to know, I'm gonna go at it a little sideways first, which is to say that I think researcher frustrations with access to digital materials in many cases originate from a lack of understanding about how libraries function. And that is true of their access to the physical materials as well as to the digital materials. Their frustration with discovery about on-site materials as well as discovery of digital materials. So truly, I think that the opportunity to always work with researchers to understand that when they're doing this, to find this thing that happens within a whole realm of work processes and decision making and expertise that they are one piece actually of that workflow i truly hope that i really think that helps them to understand better the thing they are trying to do which is to locate and call up something um, so that's that's my first answer my second answer is the things that um, I think that are, are most frustrating to researchers is um, when the thing they're trying to describe is elusive to them because uh, the metadata is uh, is not describing it in the same way that they are. Um, and this is, you know, this is again a question of not understanding kind of cataloging standards, not understanding that uh, library catalogs don't always work, in fact, the way that a Google search works. Um, so um, you know, I, I could go on. I mean, there are, you know, there are ways that it's super frustrating for researchers to see, uh, to see books digitized and have to turn pages in ways that don't actually replicate the pages. Um, a failure to digitize the whole thing. Everybody wants every aspect of it. You want the spine, you want the cover, you want the fore edge, you want, you want everything. You don't just, and, you know, researchers are rarely just interested in the text. So, I mean, there's a, there's a whole basket of things, but every one of those, I think, comes down to not understanding where they where their requests fit in uh, in the kind of workflow. And again, from the perspective of the researcher, are there elements of the library's workflow that that demand greater attention? You you happen to reference metadata, and, and I think we're all aware of the criticality of metadata in the online environment, but what other areas might occur to you? Well, <laughs> this might seem a little bit basic, but, um, you know, we think about um, the significance of when a person is in our reading room, being able to one on one speak to the researcher about the object they're observing, and how do you do that in a digital environment. Um, so is there a place in, in uh, digital representation um, or in a digital object where you can take the opportunity to say, this item that you're looking at, it has this set of properties. 
every researcher who goes to a special collections library knows if they didn't instantly, they already, you know, they're, they're, they will quickly learn that library staff know so much and are an incredible resource far beyond the card catalog, far beyond the website that you wanna to talk to the librarians, but how do we actually make that happen in a digital environment? We are stressed enough to make it happen in the physical environment, but how do we do that? Um, I think that's really important. Um, we can never convey either in the metadata, we can never convey all that we know and all that's embodied in the expertise um, of, of, of library staff. And I'm just thinking back to that slide you displayed that showed some of the countries where your users were coming from, whether that mm -hmm. be Argentina or China. Yeah. The, the complexity of responding to that need yeah. is significant. Absolutely. Well, we um, we're launching a new platform in um, in November, and it will it will um, bring together it will synchronize these two places where our digital objects are are held right now, um, and we're trying to do some of this contextual work um, in that platform. We are trying to represent our digital collections um, a little more, as I said, within the container of the whole library, and also to try to. Uh, intervene a little bit um, earlier on in the user experience about how they encounter that. Now, ours is a very specific kind of library. You know, all of our materials are, with very few exceptions, pre-1800. So when you're describing for some uh, a user who's interested in a 1645 publication from Mexico City, you know, that's a very different kind of thing. It's an object. Um, you know, you're not talking about a whole run of newspapers or you're not talking about a set of rural histories. It's really different. Ours are, you know, ours is a very specific um, issue or challenge. And I see somebody dropped a real quick question in the chat for you, which was that they were curious to know what new platform it is that you are migrating to. Can you talk about that briefly? Yeah, so um, so <laughs> I was just talking with someone from um, from another uh, library, a bigger public library yesterday and saying, wow, um, isn't it everybody's building them, them themselves. Um, so we are we're actually building um, we're building a platform. Um, so it isn't going to be out of the box. Um, but uh, our hope is that some of the tools that we have developed along the way will be, first of all, open source and that we can share right away what we've learned in the process of building this platform. Um, again, it's particular to the kinds of needs that I've identified and the kinds of priorities I've identified here. Not every library may be interested in doing this kind of highly contextual work or feel that it is mission central to do that kind of highly contextual work, but, but for us it is. Well, Karen, as always, you give such a fascinating <laughs> discussion and I always wish there's more time to sit and talk to you about the work Thank that you. you've done. This is very interesting stuff. So I very much appreciate your time. Thank you so um, much, Jill. It was a pleasure as always. Thank you.